Mr. President. I'm delighted to be with you today uh, and delighted to have such a wonderfully uh, diverse and distinguished and interesting group of panelists for this evening. Uh, I know March is Women's History Month. And that's why we are celebrating women in SYA uh, over the course of the year and celebrating that in relation to our 50th anniversary of co-education. So I'm delighted again to have these folks on the screen with me this evening. Um, let me begin by saying a few thank yous. Uh, thank you for those of you who've taken time uh, today to be here and listening uh, and participating. I also want to thank our alumni who have been uh, involved in a number of things, uh, <laughs> sadly through Zoom and not in person this year, but a number of things that we have hosted, uh, including language classes and webinars on a number of different topics. And I uh, also want to thank uh, the alums who have uh, participated in our first ever comprehensive capital campaign, which ends this June, and those who will be uh, helping us in that endeavor over the next few weeks. I also really want to thank our faculty right now. They, as you know, do not have students with them, and that's a sad moment for them because they just thrive on having the students with them. But right now they are preparing to have the students for next fall. So in each of our countries, they are working with their resident directors and doing a host of different things uh, to get ready for uh, uh, really uh, evolving our curriculum where we get students much more involved in the local communities. And so they're working on new lesson plans and, uh, and are, again, super excited to have people coming on back in the fall. And I want to say a special thanks to our admissions operation who are, have found a number of uh, very interested students uh, and we're uh, going to be at capacity for next year or maybe even over capacity. And that's just makes our hearts sing uh, after the year we've, we've all experienced. Um, and those students will be following in the intrepid footsteps of the panelists you'll meet tonight. I'm going to now introduce the uh, moderator of the panel, uh, and that is Holland Goss Lynch. France class of 86. Um, and Holland is an incredible volunteer for SYA. She's been a leader on the board for us and uh, uh, just always there for whatever we need. And I thank her uh, tremendously for all that assistance. Um, she's also someone who found SYA through Hotchka School, uh, where she was a student. And then she went over to Rennes for a year. She then went on to Georgetown and, and majored in French Lit then went on to um, get a degree in library of science and medieval history, eventually ended up to the New York Public Library. Uh, and she now uh, lives actually back on the West Coast because that's where she's from originally and with her family and, uh, and uh, is just really involved in day-to-day in -day life with us. So thank you, Holland. And thank you, panelists, one and all. And I'm even looking at Caitlin, whom I remember way back when she, when she was a student in high school. So. Uh, it's great to see you all. So, Holland, I'm going to turn it to you, and you can uh, introduce this great group. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Uh, that was a very kind introduction, uh, and I uh, join you in thanking everyone for being here tonight, and thanking, or, or this afternoon, or this morning, or wherever you might be, um, whatever time of day it is. Um, and uh, I join you in welcoming our audience and our panelists to our discussion today, Empower Her, Finding Her Voice. I think most every SYA alum that I've spoken with can remember that moment when they had their first real conversation in the language of their host country. It's a very powerful experience to be seen fully for the first time after weeks or months of feeling like only part of you has come across to others. Um, and it's really just one small step in the larger process uh, that we all go through in finding our voice in the wider world. Um, and today we have a really extraordinary group of women uh, here, all of whom have, who have wonderfully unique and inspiring stories of how they found their voices and how SYA played uh, a part in, in their doing so. So I hope you will join me in giving a warm welcome to Ari Gibson, uh, can give a little wave maybe, uh, Merritt Moore, Maya 
Smith, Caitlin Solomini, and Chloe Tempchin. And <laughs> rather than my introducing uh, them all, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask each of them to speak for about five minutes each um, and to tell us in her own words uh, about her life and how she found her voice. Uh, and then I'll circle back with some um, follow-up questions. And if there are any questions from the audience, uh, please feel free to submit those through the, um, the raise hand or Q&A uh, function there. Um, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. So uh, we'll go in order of class year, I think. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Caitlin Solomini who is China, class of 1997, and she joins us from Oahu, Hawaii. Hi. Oh, class year. So I have to go first. I was like, oh, wait, does that mean that the youngest goes first? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm Caitlin. And um, wow, it's, it's lovely. I am so honored to sit among these panelists and I know among a lot of alums who find that the SYA experience was so meaningful to them. So for me, I cannot, honestly, I cannot envision my life without SYA because it was directly impactful in terms of both my, you know, just sort of my academic interests and then beyond that into my career and my personal life. Um, so when I attended, um, SYA in 96. I always have to think, by the way, about, wait, what year was I? Because at the time, the China program was only half a year. So I was there in 1996, but technically we're the class of 97. So even today I had to go back. <laughs> so what year was that? Um, also, it's been a really long time. So, um, you know, China then obviously was very different um, than it is now. And things, I mean, the world, I think, in many ways was very different. And so in, in terms of my um, participating today, I was thinking a lot about um, a lot about just global globalization in general and the way that things have shifted in the last twenty something years um, for me, anyways, in terms of my relationship with China and um, my experience with SYA was very deeply tied with my host family. I had never left the U.S. before, lived in China, and I. Um, was very, very close to them immediately. I and mean, I think that the SYA experience obviously also really does an incredible job of finding families and students who believe in the same sort of things that I think the students who are attracted to the SYA experience also um, are attracted to. And so I, every time I kept going back to China repeatedly after that first experience. And so every time I went back, I would stay with my host family, you know, um, I even dragged my then boyfriend, now husband of almost 20 years with me to China right after college. And we went straight back to my little, um, <laughs> little very small apartment, which is like, wait, is it, should I be doing this? Should I be bringing my boyfriend? And, you know, it's like that same sort of family experience of like, I guess I'm bringing my boyfriend to stay here. Um, and because of that really intimate relationship that I had with a family who had such a different background and history than I had having grown up in New England of all places in the US. Um, I really just felt as if there was such an interesting um, opportunity, I guess, to tell a story um, in the US and to, you know, it was both on a personal side, right? Of like just the conversations that I would have with friends or family about what, what was I doing going back to China all these times and what was I studying? And then as I learned that I really wanted to become a writer, you know, in terms of my career, I um, worked with my family and understanding, you know, deeper stories that, that they had sort of alluded to over time. And then really thinking about what it meant to carry those stories and to be a foreigner abroad in a certain um, country and what that meant and what sort of responsibility you have in terms of navigating those relationships, how you retell other people's stories. Um, and so that really was, like I said, a, a really direct, like sort of launching pad for me to then um, become a writer as I'm doing now. And so um, I think the, the, the ability, you know, and back to the original question about voice, the ability to have 
relationships that you don't anticipate and to really fall in love with people that you would never have expected. Um, that for me was really directly impactful in terms of what, you know, I ended up becoming and doing and uh, sort of side note, except not really my daughter. Um, so I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old and my daughter is now fluent in Mandarin. Um, I felt like it was so important for me that she was able to speak to the people that I love that, you know, my Chinese father doesn't speak a lick of English. So I needed that to be able to, you know, facilitate the continued relationships that I wanted to, and, and obviously other friends and um, relationships that I had in China. And so she now speaks Chinese and um, it's really interesting to see her development and also how things again have changed and that now she's in this pandemic pod right now with other Mandarin speaking children that we've sort of built in the midst of all of this. And um, it's really exciting that she's like, talks about how she wants to go, she's been to China and how she wants to go back to China. So there was, there's a through line there in terms of just continuing those, you know, not just language, but obviously like cross-cultural opportunities that um, that SY initially facilitated for me and that um, I'm really, really, really grateful for because I can't imagine my life in any other way. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> well, thank you. That is uh, so wonderful to hear. And, and I'm, I, true confession, uh, Caitlin's book is uh, called Empire of Glass and I'm about three quarters of the way through it. I, I tried so hard to finish it last night and I, I didn't quite get there, but it's a wonderful <laughs> book and I'm learning so much. I've never been to China and I'm learning okay. so much. So thank you for writing it. It's really, it's really wonderful. And we'll come back and maybe <laughs> talk about that a little bit more um, uh, later. Uh, so our, our next panelist uh, in order of class year uh, is Maya Smith. She's Spain, class of 1999, and she is joining us today from Seattle, Washington. Thank you so much, Holland. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be sharing the stage with these incredible women who have each done really unique and inspiring things with their lives and careers. It's fun to hear how SYA fits into their narrative arc. Um, I know it's a central place in mine. Uh, so I attended SYA Spain in 98, 99 during the program's first year in Saragossa, or as I quickly learned, Baragofa. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, while I had always been good at written language exams, speaking Spanish was often a terrifying experience. Um, I had struggled with some speech issues in my first language, English, such as auditory discrimination and pronunciation, um, and thus seldom spoke up, particularly in large group settings. Uh, so you can imagine that speaking in a foreign language was quite the harrowing experience. Um, I also had left my very large racially diverse hometown of Houston, Texas for a city that was quite insular and homogeneous at the time. Um, now 10% of the current population of Tharagotha are foreign nationals, but that percentage was much less in the late 90s. And so I not only stood out as an American, my blackness was highly visible and people often made sure I knew it. To be honest, the first four months were emotionally draining. Um, my family seemed nice, but I didn't understand a word they said. <laughs> and so my voice constantly faltered and I retreated into myself. But something happened one day over Christmas break, and this speaks to what Holland was talking about in the introduction. Um, the words my family were speaking started to have meaning in my head, and the words that came out of my mouth finally conveyed the thoughts, emotions, and aspirations um, that had been imprisoned in my mind for all those months. The next five months were probably some of the best I've ever had. I continued to gain both confidence and fluency. I got to know my host family very well, with my host mother becoming a second mom to me. Um, and over 20 years later, we still communicate, which is just incredible. Um, I traveled throughout Spain and was officially bitten by the travel bug. I've now been up to over 70 countries, and it was a, the freedom of movement during my junior year of high school that let me know that that was possible. What started off as somewhat of a nightmare turned out to be my greatest accomplishment, and I learned and lived the power of words, and this experience shaped my whole life trajectory. I chose my college based on my goal to travel the world and learn its languages. 
NYU allowed me to do two years abroad with no conditions. I went back to Spain, Madrid this time, and then France, and then Senegal. I volunteered my summers in Mexico and Brazil. I earned a PhD in, from Berkeley in Romance Languages and Linguistics by writing a dissertation on Senegalese migration to Paris and Rome. I then became a professor at the University of Washington, where I am now, and have dedicated my research to focusing on the intersections of language, race, identity, mobility, and belonging. My book, Senegal Abroad, was a labor of love deeply rooted in my life history. What the 80 plus members of the Senegalese diaspora that I interviewed in France, Italy, and the United States shared, what they shared with me echoed my own experiences. They conveyed what it was like to exist in predominantly white spaces and black bodies. To be asked to show papers, something I too have experienced, often the only one of my classmates to be forced to prove, I, to be, to prove that I belonged in Europe. To be told as speakers from a francophone country such as Senegal that their version of French was inferior, just like my accent betrays my foreignness, my otherness, my supposed less than. At the same time, my interviewees also highlighted their tenacity, resolve, and most importantly, their power. Many of them share their pride in being multilingual, and it is true, Senegalese are renowned for their multilingual abilities. It is through these stories of multilingualism that the Senegalese diaspora controls their narrative. They are not just members of marginalized communities. They also express mobility, creativity, and agency as they tap into a transnational, cosmopolitanism. In doing so, they create identities that champion their ability to move across borders and languages. My interviewees inspire me, and I tell their stories as well as my own when I teach. I have found that sharing difficulties with students allows them to conquer their own linguistic insecurities or their struggles with belonging, because only by acknowledging these insecurities and struggles can we prepare students to overcome them. I have started equity and inclusion initiatives in second language learning spaces to ensure that any person who wants to learn another language has every opportunity to do so because nothing is more empowering than language, specifically the ability to switch and shift between languages. Learning a language and living in a foreign place is hard for most people, but it is one of the most rewarding things the world has to offer. It not only teaches you about yourself, it also allows you to have empathy for others, something that is so necessary, particularly in this day and age. Anyone can become multilingual. I am living proof. I wouldn't have found these tools or this belief in myself if it hadn't been for SYA. The experience gave me a space to find my voice and I have been using it ever since. And so for that, I am extremely grateful. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. I I feel speechless. That that was very moving, and I think spoke to so many of our experiences uh, through through life. Thank you so much, Maya. Um. So, Chloe Temption is our next panelist. Um, Spain, class of two thousand, joining us from. Los Angeles, California today. Well, it's so wonderful to meet all of you and to, to be here. And I basically give up because you did such a great job. <laughs> There's no point. <laughs> no, um, I think that in order to kind of give the story of how I found my voice, I really have to kind of give my story, which I'll try to make as brief as possible, uh, which is basically that the, the corny thing that we all say, which is that our voice finds us. And in my case, I really do feel so strongly uh, that that's what happened. My life has always been music. Grew up, my father would bring me to a Baptist church in Harlem where I listened to gospel music for hours on end, which seeped in. And it was just music, music, music. Ended up in high school, which is where SYA comes in and will come in at the end. And everything was sort of going well, as you would hope it would go. And I was becoming progressively short of breath as time went on, I was getting on stage. By the time I'd be on stage, I couldn't breathe. Um, it became doctor, 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 doctor for five years. We had no idea what was going on. I had already been to Spain, um, to Saragossa. And so I then end up in a situation where I'm in heart failure 
and I, in New York at the time, told that I have very little time left to live, which of course is not very good news, and shoot to me doing everything in my power to stay alive, to get better, which thank God worked for several years until shoot forward. Now, in the meantime, I was performing. I was doing everything that I could. I had an oxygen tank named Steve Martin by my side at all my performances, and he kept me alive, um, became part of my show. And then uh, in 2020, ended up on the treadmill one day doing my walk, and my heart shot up to 175, ended up in the ER, ended up in the hospital, ended up in a, in a first having a heart attack, then in a coma for four days, then uh, on life support, and then ended up receiving a life-saving double lung transplant on August 5th. Literally came in on time to save my life. And all of this to say, so not a very dramatic story, <laughs> just a typical story, um, but all of this to say that I'm gonna give you a very sort of out of the box thing first in terms of how SYA literally saved me when I was in the hospital, but first I'll drink water. So there I am lying there thinking that my life is over. And what do I do? I call upon every single memory that I can that was my Saragossa experience. And, you know, I always talk about kind of drawing in your past when you need it to get through these difficult times because I had such an incredible time in Spain and because I'm still connected to my family, to teachers out there. I have such wonderful memories that I can't even begin to tell you how important these memories were to me. And I know this is, again, this is not a typical sort of how, you know, SYA changed your life, but it literally saved me during these incredibly difficult times. So I, I've used all of that. And I think that in general, of course, everything that we do, as all of you have said, helps form who we are and helps us find our voice. And it was such an impactful thing going to Spain, learning. I, I, I spoke, but I spoke with, you know, New York Spanish. So this is broken, terrible Spanish. And then I end up over there and it's like you said, Maya, it's like Zaragoza, and I'm relearning how to speak. And I'm like, but they, but they won't let me back in New York if I speak like that. So it was kind of this crazy relearning how to speak a little bit like them, but not totally. Um, but it was so wonderful because I was able to not only learn the language, but as you all have said, sort of understand it in a way that it feels so natural. So you start to think in that language instead of just speak the language. And that's been so helpful with regard to my life, to expanding my brain, expanding my mind, allowing me to communicate my message with so many people, allowing me to do these interviews that I do. I have a series called Super Brave Kids and I interview kids uh, who have chronic illness they're, they're, and I sort of have them empower the world because I feel that they have so many things to teach the world having been through what they've been through. And to be able to do this and communicate with them in Spanish is huge with kids who have a hard time speaking English. And I do feel so comfortable in the language, although I could use a little bit of rehearsing. <laughs> um, and since then, of course, I've been back to Spain. I've seen my family. We communicate. I had a boyfriend out there who I still am in touch with, who helped me win a, because he helped me translate a song, he helped me win a competition, an Avon competition. So it's been helpful in so many kind of strange ways um, and so many more obvious ways in terms of really helping me become who I am today. So that's the brief version. <laughs> that's that's really wonderful. We're, we're so glad that you got that lung transplant. Oh. <laughs> and, I would not, there would be a blank screen right now had that happened. <laughs> I know, I know. And um, I'm not sure if uh, if you said, but you you have started singing again. I have, I have which is crazy. And I have a, a um, paralyzed vocal cord, which has made it very tricky for the past 11 years. But I have, I'm, I've started singing and now with these lungs that I can breathe into in a completely new way. So I'm, I'm relearning at this point everything, everything about life. Sounds, sounds like the first few months of SYA. All exactly. Of <laughs> it's a different version of SYA with new lungs. <laughs> and I would love for the day when I can actually go back, God willing, you know, and like this and actually breathe, you know. Right. Wow. Uh, well, thank you for sharing all of that uh, with, with us. And um, again, so much to 
delve into. I kept saying to Susan, I could spend an hour with each one of these women and we still wouldn't cover everything uh, that, that we'd like to talk about. So um, thank you all for, for being succinct um, and, uh, and being here. Um, so uh, Merit Moore is up next. She is uh, from, the, from Italy, class of 2005. And she is joining us today from Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. So you win for the, the furthest <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> for the Zoom in weirdest times. Um, but thank you so much um, for, yeah, inviting me here. And it's so great to be here with the panelists and um, the participants. And yeah, I mean, SYA, it was monumental in terms of finding my voice and um, the path that I ended up leading. So for a little background, I was born and raised in LA. Um, I was the type where I, yeah, I, I wasn't very verbal. Like I, I didn't communicate much with words. Um, didn't speak till I was three and would communicate, but mostly with like body language um, and, and struggled a little bit with words in terms of finding it natural um as a way of communication and so when I found dance at 13 that's where I was like oh this feels so raw and authentic to how I want to express myself um but by the time I was 15 I was my love for dance had very much dwindled I because I started so late I was often told that I would never make it as a professional ballet dancer and so even though I was passionate about it and putting in all the hours with like that faint hope and that dream of of pursuing it. I think by the time I was 15, I was feeling quite dismayed by the situation being like, so why am I working so hard at this if I'm never going to make it? And I started questioning everything. I was like, so then why am I studying at school? Like, what are the point of grades? Like, why am I waking up? Like, well, like, wait, what's the point of like, what's the point of everything? Um, and so at that point, I just remember being in my Latin class and someone walked, uh, came in and, or, or the teacher had like a pamphlet of school year abroad and was like, well, you know, you can go to Italy for a year and stay with this host family and, um, and, and study Latin there. And I literally like jumped out of my seat and grabbed that pamphlet because I was afraid that everyone else would jump out of their seat and grab it. <laughs> I ended up being the only one in that class like <laughs> grabbing for that experience, but I was just like, I have to go. Like, this is something I have to do. Um, I just felt that urge. And it was interesting because also my, what my passions were dance and then more on the math science side. But in school year abroad in Italy, they didn't provide science. Um, but I just, I didn't care. So I was on that flight and heading over there. Um, and also I had decided I wanted to quit dance. So I had looked up, I was like, Google does the therapy this tiny town have dance and Google was like, no. And I was like, great, I'm going, we're off. Um, and so I arrived there in Viterbo and just having a wonderful experience. And I remember going to the gym and one of the studios, like this kind of looked like a dungeon like room. And there was a teacher training, uh, teaching a dance class there. She was substituting and coming in from Rome through, uh, three to four times a week to train the students there. And her name was Irina Roska. And I remember seeing her class and being like, eyeing it and then being like, no, I'm not doing it. I told myself I'm quitting dance, like there's no way. Um, and then she was there again and I was like, mm, okay, so I'll just watch. And then by the third class, I was in the class and she just took me under her wing, um, wing and we started training and then every weekend I would go to, to her place in Rome. I would sleep on her kitchen floor. We'd wake up at 6 a.m. and she'd start training me. I would go to company class in the morning, then she'd teach me privately for two hours, then I would have lunch and then she would train me again. And I mean, until midnight, I'm dancing off the radiator. And, and then after school year abroad, I went back for the next six years, every Christmas break, every spring break, every summer break to train with her, sleeping on her kitchen floor. Um, 
And there was so much support from my host family, from my own family back at home, from school year abroad. Um, and so I rediscovered dance and that, and, and that has been a huge part of my life. Um, the other aspect of it was my, my love for science, which I hadn't, you know, I had a feeling I really liked it. Like I always loved math, um, but I, I was unsure. So at school year abroad, um, I was taking pre-calc, I was a junior, so I was taking pre-calc and there was so much flexibility that when I asked me like, can I audit the uh, AP calculus AB class as well? And they're like, sure, of course. And they were so welcoming and I got extra help on the AP calc class as I was taking pre-calc. So I was auditing the AP calc and at the end took the exam and got a five. And I think that was also um, huge because I was given that space and that kind of personal attention and that encouragement to pursue something that I really love to do. And um, from there, you know, returned back to high school I took my first physics class my senior year and applied for college and and decided yeah physics was what I wanted to do so I was at Harvard and I was studying physics and um, I you know didn't know if I would ever make it as a professional ballet dancer but I'd been I was during that time going back to Italy to train with Irene Rosca um, who would you know and and that's also where I mostly learned my Italian and so now I know every body part you could possibly like the spala, la, 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 la skin, that like la gamba. You know, it was like um, I still hear her uh, voice in my head. And actually, I went back uh, last, well, because of COVID. So I guess two years ago, back to Italy, back to well, this time I upgraded to sleeping on our living room floor, um, but trained with her again because it was so important and. So I, yeah, and so then I was studying physics and, and there had the, because I'd also been in Italy and taken that summer, sorry, have I been talking for way too, okay, summarizing this really quick. <laughs> um, because after that year in Italy, like that summer afterwards, I, I felt like I, I owned Europe, like I was like, oh, no problem. Like I know all the train stations, I know every airport. Like, so I, would, I spent the whole summer going to, I was at Royal Ballet, then I was at Cannes. I was doing little summer programs throughout Europe. And so during my sophomore year at college, every spring break, every break I had, I was then also auditioning and go, flying back to Europe. And I felt like I could navigate it. So I was on my own, just going through auditions, um, and got into Zurich Ballet. So I then went to Zurich Ballet, then back to college and Boston Ballet. So I jumped back and forth between college companies, um, later PhD ballet companies. And um, yeah, and it's all because of school year abroad. So I am infinitely grateful. Thank you, Merritt. I think, um... So many of us think of SYA as being a um, an entry to uh, really language humanities um, discovery and development, and really fascinating to hear that you uh, saw it as you know dance and um, math and and um, really uh, wonderful. I I'm you have so many accomplishments in in life. Um, I think that you made it through calculus and got a five is in my mind, like the near impossible. I, that was something I could never have even dreamed of. So hooray as a junior. No, I think that's really, um, thank you for, for sharing um, your very broad experience there. And finally, Ari Gibson, our most recent alumna, uh, Spain class of 2020, um, so recently returned and um, she is joining us today from Charlotte, North Carolina. So take it away, Ari. 
Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be on here. You all are so impressive. And I'm a senior now and like to even be thought of for a panel like this really means a lot. I think what I'm going to do is kind of give like a little overview of my life and it's going to go into how SYA has impacted me. So I was born in Chicago, Illinois. I lived there for about a year. And then I was in Carmel, Indiana for about seven. So that's where I would say I grew up. Uh, we moved to Waterloo, Belgium for about four years for my dad's job. And um, there, I did gymnastics um, from a young age. I stopped, like, I think freshman year. But there I did gymnastics and learned um, French, which was very exciting. And I really fell in love with the French or with the Belgian culture. Um, so then when we moved back to the U.S., um, oh, also there, I was very motivated to start fighting to stop human trafficking. Um, as an expat, uh, we were there from when I was eight until I was about 12. So as I got older, my parents were like, there are some things that you need to be aware of. There are people that don't necessarily want the best for you. And as an expat, you are at risk um, of being trafficked. And I watched, I believe it was Taken, the movie Taken, yes, Taken like one and two. And I saw how easily um, an American girl that wanted to party in Paris was trafficked. And it really just kind of woke me up. And I decided that I wanted to do something about it. And that was in the fifth grade. And we had like these big, this big uh, primary years program exhibition, if anyone's familiar with like the middle school kind of um, the middle school version of IB, I would say. And I decided to focus on human trafficking. I did a lot of research into it. Um, and from there, I started my own nonprofit to fight against it. And that's something that I'm still very passionate about now. Uh, but that's kind of uh, where I started with that journey. And then we moved back to the US when I was 12. So it was the summer of um, right before seventh grade. And I was really excited to be back in the US because you see all the movies of like high school in the US and prom and I was like, oh, I can't wait. Like it's gonna be really fun. And it was great. Um, it was good. There was definitely a little bit of adjusting that you have to do. Uh, now I go to Providence Day School in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I love it here. I like the school a lot. Uh, one thing that definitely just kind of has to be acknowledged is that it's hard to be um, it's hard to be one of few black girls in any situation. And this is not to say that my school is doing anything wrong. I have my head of upper school on this, I believe, to support me as well as one of <laughs> one of my teachers, um, Adam Bridget, and I absolutely love her. Um, but it's just kind of something that you have to recognize, and it can be really easy to want to assimilate to your environment. Uh, when you're one of few. And so I remember I had kind of a difficult conversation with one of my teachers and I left that meeting feeling like I just needed a new perspective and to see how I really was supposed to fit into where I, um, and to see where I really, how I was supposed to fit into my role in the world. And so I had seen stuff about SYA and I looked it up again. My parents before were like, you're not doing a whole year abroad. Like we're gonna already lose you in a couple of years. I'm the middle child, so they love me. Um, <laughs> but they were like, I'm gonna lose you in a couple of years. You're not doing a year abroad. And I left that meeting and I was like, I'm applying. I was like, I'm applying to SYA and there's nothing you can do to stop me. And they were pretty supportive when they saw how passionate I was about it. And I think it was due like three days after that meeting and I just submitted it as quickly as I could. And luckily it worked out for me. And SYA really just offered me the opportunity to, to figure out who I was and to see all that I could do by myself and with the support of others. So I had the best host family ever. I talked to my host sister like every three, four days. Um, she always has new <laughs> like drama for me. It's great to practice the language as well. And I really just feel like my voice was restored and kind of found in new ways. So that's something that I definitely would thank SYA for. Um, now as a senior, I'm looking forward to kind of figuring out where I land for my college career, but I know that this was gonna be an important step along the way. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ari. And yes, you really, you are in some, in many ways at the very beginning of, of uh, a great journey. Um, and uh, so wonderful that SYA could be a part of that for you. Um, so thank you all so much for sharing uh, your, your stories. I, if, I think we'll go back in the, in the same order and just uh, delve a little deeper into some of the things that, that you said, um, if, that's, if that's all right. Um, 
so Caitlin, I'll just go back to you. So you um, wrote this wonderful novel, um, Empire of Glass, and uh, it is, it has a very interesting structure to it. Um, it's, uh, it definitely takes off from your, from your year um, in, with SYA in, in China. And the, the narrator of the work is really that she's presented as the translator of a Chinese um, book or documents that she has. And so it's presented as a story within a story and a translation and um, footnotes from the translator interjected throughout. And it's just a very interesting way to construct um, a cross-cultural uh, novel. And I would just love to hear you talk a little bit more about why you chose to structure it that way. and. Um, whatever else you'd like to, to say about that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I think that's a great question. And I think, again, speaks to some of the points that I had raised earlier in terms of what I felt um, coming out of, obviously, the, you know, not only the SYA experience, but also the relationships that I had built and what that meant and just how important and um I think in some ways, you know, obviously when you're, um, when you're not, you know, I, I was clearly, I am not natively Chinese. Um, and yet I felt so much, uh, love and connection, honestly, like, I mean, just to boil it down to its simplest nature as everyone here, I think has experienced and has also raised, um, and so then becoming a writer and trying to tell that story, I was really interested in the fact that clearly, I mean, I, I cannot extract, you know, my own experiences and who I am and the identity that I have from, you know, the 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 material that I'm also working with. And so I think it was impossible for me to have written that story either A as saying, you know, I am now writing this as, you know, as these Chinese characters. I mean, I think that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it just is impossible. It wouldn't make any sense to have done that that way. Um, so I had to wrestle with that personally and also, you know, creatively and, and, and think about how the frame and form of a, of a book as a, you know, as a representation of a story, what that means and how, the, what the, what the wrapping of it means and all of that. So I think that was, you know, that was a huge part of why the story was told and how we tell stories in general, right. Um, and why it was told in that way. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think, you know, it's interesting to think about how our own experiences then impact, you know, as everyone mentioned here, their own work or their own careers or just um, the questions and the activism that we, you know, are, are also involved in. And so um, that was a really big piece of that. Um, and I, yeah, thank you for raising that question. Well, it's really, um, for me, who's never been to China, and I'm sure many readers who haven't, it's it's all been in many ways a translation of the the culture to me uh, of, of China um, as anything. So it's it's really um, it's been a great a great read. Um, and and Maya, you too have written um, a book about language and identity, which you spoke about a lot uh, when you were when you were talking. And um, what you what you did not say, which I think is uh, true of you, is that you speak five languages am, am i right english french italian portuguese and spanish correct yes yes which is really <laughs> quite remarkable um and uh i i'm curious to know if you feel as though you have a um slightly different identity within each one of those languages and and related to that is also something that that Caitlin uh, spoke about, and and you you haven't spoken about it, but I saw somewhere you you mentioned it. You both have children um, to whom you speak uh, a language other than your um, birth language, and so I just um, am curious if you if you identify. And I, I'm not sure actually what language you speak to your child because you have so many to choose from. But but is your identity as a mother tied to a particular language? Oh, interesting. 
Yeah, it's it's funny because all my languages, the, the question you ask is a question that I ask my interviewees often. It's like, do you feel like a different person when you speak a different language? And it's a question that always gets them to laugh, right? Because uh, often you don't think about it um, unless you are studying your sociolinguist. You, this is something you're studying. And it's true. I, I, I identify with each language differently. I have different memories um, that are attached to each language, depending on where I learned it, depending on my relationships within these languages. Um, and, and so, yes, <laughs> you know, to answer your question simply, yes. Um, so I have a six month old. And so this is new. And I'm deciding, okay, what is his language trajectory going to be? You know, I grew up in a monolingual family, didn't start learning languages until high school. Um, and the poor thing, I mean, I'm just throwing all the languages at him, <laughs> you know? So I'm speaking to him most in French, um, just because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in a French department, I'm a professor of French. Um, but our um, the person who takes care of him speaks in Spanish. And so I figured, okay, so he has Spanish covered there. I'll do some French, right? But I play music in all different languages, including languages I don't know. Um, I think it's just important for him to be exposed to them. Um, but I don't have any sort of expectations of him. It's his journey to decide what languages are going to really resonate with him. Um, the important thing is just that exposure to as many languages as possible and as many people and places as possible. Yes, I think hearing so much as a young, you know, that, as that brain is developing, uh, can only serve him well when he settles on one or perhaps speaks you know, five in his own special language. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's so interesting to, to think about. Um, and, and Chloe, uh, you, I'm, I'm, uh, nothing for me. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so many, I actually, I have a, a few different questions. And I thought, which direction do I want to go? And, and, um, uh -oh. <laughs> I think, I think I just, I, I want to ask you a little bit more about your, um, work with, uh, with kids and, um, their, uh, helping them tell their stories. And you had mentioned a little bit, your um, super brave kids. And I watched a couple of the videos and was just really amazed at how much they had to tell us that maybe they didn't even realize they were telling us. And so I, I wonder if you could um, just expand a little on how you see them benefiting from being able to talk to you and tell their story to others um, about their experiences with transplants or illnesses. Well, it's actually exactly what you say, which is their ability, I think, to help others is what helps them so much. And I only say that because it's what's helped me so much. Um, and not that I'm <laughs> helping others in such a tremendous way. My God, I'm, I don't know if I'm doing anything, but just the feeling that you're able to help someone is so powerful, uh, especially when you're going through such a difficult time. And it really came from this thing that I call the smile tour, which is a tour that I created where, you know, I was going from hospital to hospital, visiting these kids and in person and singing. And as I was singing, you know, after the song would end, we would sit on the bed, the bed, the hospital bed, and we would just chat. And it was, I was kind of floored by the, the conversations we were having. And I'm like, oh my gosh, these, they, these kids know so much about life, that this is crazy. This, this stuff has to be shared. And I would leave these, these, you know, um, moments feeling so fulfilled. And then of course COVID happened and actually worked out in, in just specifically in this sense, which is that I thought, wow, there's gotta be a, a way to sort of do this. And then Zoom came around as like this typical way of doing things. And all of a sudden I thought, oh my goodness, what if I had this interview series with these kids and had them share their, their stories and what they've learned. And so that's sort of how the whole thing was birthed. And it really, um, it's, the whole thing was dedicated and is dedicated to uh, Humaira Bodanya, who's an eight-year-old girl who I was so connected to, who died from pulmonary hypertension. So the Smile Tour was in her honor, and then it morphed into the Super Brave Kids. And it's just such a uplifting 
thing that you sort of think is going to be kind of depressing. And I went into it thinking, I don't know if I can do this because talking to these kids about all this, you know, dramatic health and this, and you get on there and these are the happiest kids in the world. They have the biggest smiles. They're so appreciative of just being alive. Um, you know, everything else, like I say, everything else is an added bonus. And, you know, you feel that so strongly when you talk to them. So you leave these, or I leave these interviews so inspired myself. And, you know, again, it's, I'm just so grateful that I can have these interviews in English and Spanish. I speak French as well in French. It just makes it so much bigger. And it just is personally, selfishly, very fulfilling. <laughs> All for me. <laughs> Well, it's it's very meaningful, even for those of us who have not been through that to to see these kids. It's really inspiring, and thank thank, thank you, you for watching for doing that work. Um, and uh, um, so, one of the other questions I thought about asking you, and then I was going to go right into asking Merritt a similar question, is about. Um, Things that we don't always necessarily think of as languages, singing, um, and then uh, and and merit. I I feel as though you communicate through. I mean, would you consider dance to be a language in which you communicate? Would you consider physics to be a language in which you communicate? And do you feel as though you can convey uh, things through those? Um, um, areas that you that you can't necessarily convey through this the spoken word. You, you talked a little bit about about being um, not an especially verbal uh, child, so uh, that that came to mind as a question for you. Yeah, certainly. I found dance was like the most raw, authentic way of expressing myself because it was like whatever emotion I felt, you know, in my gut, it was just an immediate release, and and it was just so true to. Um, what I was feeling. Um, whereas with words, it was like, you could say, I like it, but it's like, do you like it or, or do you like it? You know, it's it, somehow it, finding the right word, um, it wouldn't come immediately. Yeah. Um, so certainly, and then, and, and, and also with physics, it's, um, I mean, I'm not using like math equations or all those Greek letters to like express emotions, but definitely communicating one's thought process of like, mm, right, you know, you're using the math to describe a situation, to describe the story of your experiment, which is, you know, perhaps like this very high powered laser beam entering this nonlinear crystal that's creating then these like two entangled photons. Um, and so that story of the experiment is all through math. Well, that's beautifully put <laughs> in language. You, you, I think you have become very verbal. So mm -hmm. uh, that was a um, perfect expression of how, how math and dance can, can tell us stories too. Um, and, and Ari, I'm going to come back to you. And I have to say, as I was looking at all the things that you do in life, the first question that came to mind is, when do you ever sleep? But that doesn't really make for a great conversational um, question. I mean, you, you're welcome to tell us when you when you sleep. Um, you've uh, I sleep a lot. No worries. I make it work. Huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> naps during the day. You know, try to do your work a little bit faster. I was I was a gymnast when I was younger, so you kind of get used to a fast paced life, and you figure out how to do your work quickly so you can get a little bit of sleep in, right? Oh, well, that's a great strategy. I, I <laughs> haven't you. quite learned that one yet, but um, and I'm I'm just. Uh, I, I'm very interested in the fact that you got started uh, working with this human trafficking um, uh, work in Belgium, and then you've done some work on it here in the States, and presumably in in Spain, you were able to um, continue that. And I, I'm curious to know if your time in different um, countries has has changed your perspective on it or I, that's I'm having a little bit of a hard time formulating the question but uh, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about um, this issue and uh, its relevance in these different countries and if that has shaped your thinking about it and how you share um, the issue with others and communicate it to others. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so my, the name of my nonprofit organization is I Stop Traffic. And I was originally motivated by how um, it showed up kind of for expats in Belgium specifically. But upon like doing more research, I realized how big of a problem it was in Europe in general. And then when we moved to Charlotte, um, in Charlotte, because of the location, uh, because of the big events that we have here, um, how we're close to the highway, to big highways. So really, I think being in different locations has showed me how it occurs in places around the world because it is different. Um, sometimes it shows up through immigration. Other times it's kids that run away from their families. And sometimes it's a mix of both. Uh, so I think definitely being in Spain and Belgium and in the U.S. has showed me just the different ways that it shows up. And the more that you kind of learn about an issue that's like this, the harder it is or the more inclined you are to want to fight it. So since I kind of started at a young age, um, I've just been inspired with every new place that I've been in. I know for in Spain, we had our capstone project and we didn't get quite to finish it because of COVID. And so we were just doing like initial research and I decided that I was going to do mine on human trafficking in Spain and how it shows up compared to the U.S. And just in the short research that I did there, it was really intriguing to see the differences and to understand that just being aware can really change your situation regardless of where you are. Well, thank you. And I'm sorry that you were in the class that had to, to come home from <laughs> Spain. I know that was a really rapid turnaround for all of you and, um, and probably not, not the easiest. Um, I'm, I'm aware we're getting close to, to our time. Um, we do have an interesting question in, in the chat, which I would love to, to toss out to you all. Um, this is from, from Marta, who says, do any of you feel that you have had or have to fight more in your field for being a woman? If yes, have you noticed any difference about this through the different cultures to which you have been exposed? And I think, uh, you know, anyone who would like to to weigh in, um, just unmute yourself and jump in, or raise your raise your hand there. I wouldn't give a good answer because I've felt I don't know what it would be to be a man, <laughs> so I don't know what the difference would be. But I personally have not felt anything other than just happy to be me, and it's all so far been. In terms of being, I don't know why I decided to answer this because I have no answer. I should probably let somebody who actually has an answer answer this. Nothing on my end. <laughs> <laughs> That's an answer. Thank you. Anybody else want to uh, to jump sure. in? I mean, I can jump in in terms of like physics. Obviously, the you know proportion, like the number of women in the field, is lower. Um, and there are a couple issues that surround that. Um, I think that the way the science is taught is, is particularly geared for one type of mindset. I wouldn't say it's just a male mindset. It's like a specific male type of mindset um, because that's the person who's writing the textbooks. And so unless you fit in that same mindset, um, you're going to struggle you're gonna struggle a lot in terms of absorbing the information. And it has nothing to do about whether or not you're bright. It's just whether or not you have the same way and style of learning it as the people who are writing the textbooks. And every textbook is written by man. Um, and in a specific, you know, they learned their physics from, you know, uh, a, a type of mindset, you know, before them. So. I think that's a bit of a struggle is, is giving oneself the time and patience to absorb information in a different way, which I found really helpful by doing this way is because, you know, you, a lot of the material that you learn is through experience and you gain and you learn how valuable that is versus a textbook. And so you stop gauging yourself based on how you do on an exam. It's more on how well you communicate when you're you know, at the, at the um, gelato, you know, place and, and not, you know, if you're, you're acing your grammar because if you can't communicate, right? Like it's all about the experience. And so I think that opened my eyes in terms of, oh, right. Okay. So what makes me a good physicist is actually the experience of it and not what happens on the exams. So that's an issue I find with women. And also um, 
yeah, there, there are various things of if women are, if they're predominantly male professors and the work hours are 24 seven, it's harder for a female grad student to be like, oh yeah, let's, okay, have a meeting at 2 a.m with a male professor, whereas for a male grad student, it's much easier. Um, so then your time allotted isn't equal to what a male grad student, you know, the amount of time they, the face time they get with a professor. Um, so there, there are various struggles with that, but I think um, it's all in a positive direction. Thank you. And uh, Ari, did you uh, want to add something to to that? I see your yeah, hand. Yeah, um, I just have a couple quick things to say. I know that I'm young and I'm not necessarily in my field yet, but definitely in my experience, I've seen how how as a Black woman, um, more than just, a, or not more than, but in addition to being a woman, um, there are different things, different experiences that I have um, from my peers. And I think um, I would say that Black women are among the most marginalized group, especially in America. And so there's just stereotypes that I've dealt with from a young age. I'm, I mean, I'm still young, being called angry, disrespectful, kind of for having an opinion. And that's something that I know wouldn't happen to uh, a white man. And I think it's really important that we have conversations where you kind of discuss the intersectionality of being a woman of color. Uh, and I think it just kind of helps me a lot to grow and to understand where I'm supposed to fit when I think about the different aspects of my identity. Thank you. That's very uh, interesting to to hear and and um, so true. I I think. Um, Anybody else want to weigh in on that? We have another um, question, which uh, Ari, I think is um, one that might be most pertinent to you. How was SYA helpful in college applications? <laughs> and I don't know, I don't, I don't quite remember quite that far back uh, being the oldest one on this panel, but, uh, but you might have something um, to say that comes from uh, an, an incoming parent. That is a great question. I, um, because of the kind of, of, kind of, because of coronavirus and the pandemic, there was, I didn't really get to visit many schools. I visited maybe two, one that my sister is, go, um, is going to, she's a senior, and one that my dad attended for grad school. So I didn't really get to visit that many schools and I kind of just, I decided to apply to a lot of schools. SYA definitely helped in that, I just had a flex. I was like, yeah, I was in Spain for the past year. Yes, I'm fluent in Spanish. Yes, I find language is very important. And especially for me, I want to pursue international business. So it's right up the alley that you should be in. And my college counselors are really good with incorporating that transcript with my transcript from school. And they made the process pretty smooth. So I would say there's nothing but positives. I know sometimes people are a little bit nervous and they're worried that um, it might not transition smoothly, that it might be a little bit difficult to come back in your senior year, but I would say that it wasn't really an issue. And that's why it helped me so much with my language that I was able to get the seal of literacy in Spanish as well as French, and that's something else that will help you with, um, with college applications. So nothing but positives for sure. Great, thank you. So uh, I think we are um, coming up against our time, and I don't know, um, I'll have to take direction from, from Susan or, or someone, someone at SYA. I, I had asked you all one last question. I'd asked you to um, prepare, I asked in advance so that you could prepare it, uh, and I will, I think we'll go ahead, unless somebody jumps on and tells me we don't have time. Oh, okay, no, I'm getting a message from Susan. We can go ahead. So I will, the final question that I'd love to ask you all is if you could use your voice to convey a message of your choosing, which language would you use? What message would you communicate? And who would be your chosen audience? And um, why don't we go in reverse order this time? So we'll start uh, with Ari. I hope you guys like hearing my voice, getting used to it. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can choose a language. I think the, the benefit of languages is being able to reach so many people. I think the, the, what, the message that I would say would just to be, your voice is important, or tu voz es importante, 
or votre voix est importante because I think it's so essential that women especially know how valid their opinions are and that it's okay to say what you think if, even if it's not what everyone else is thinking and that's something that I wish I had known a little bit earlier and that I'm happy that I know now so that's definitely what I would say. Thank you Ari, wise words uh, and merit yeah, I mean, both the dance and physics. Um, and I would then, you know, convey, well, right now I'm dancing um, during this COVID with these in an industrial robotic arm uh, with a robot. And so I think the message I would convey is uh, something that I took at heart during SYA, which is like, look, nothing's impossible. Possible just takes time. And so, you know, it takes, give your and the message would be to those who are wanting to pursue something in which they're kind of told that um, it's impossible and that it, and that uh, they might be feeling a little bit of lack of hope and just being like, you know, take your time, do it in your own way and be patient with yourself. Great, thank you. And Chloe. Oh goodness, where to begin? <laughs> So I don't even know where to begin with the message, um, but it, and it's ever evolving, of course, but I think it has been for so long to convey this similarly to merit, this feeling of hope to those who are really struggling and, you know, being told that you're going to die and trying to find that hope and having to create it for myself. I've always wanted to sort of be able to, to share that with others. And the most recent feeling, which is sort of the message I think of today for me is this, I wrote about my song called Someday. And it's a, what we all know, but it's really all about living our lives now and realizing that, you know, having faced death, um, we really don't necessarily have someday. It's not promised to any of us. And it's so real when you're facing death, you just lie there and you realize, oh my God, what was I waiting for to live my life? Nothing. So now I sort of, you know, instead of saving my soaps and saving my clothes, I'm like, go wear them, you know, go use your soaps. And I'm using superficial things, but just to convey the idea that now is your life. And it's so big for me right now that I think that's my current message. What language? Clearly Spanish. <laughs> if this were SYA France, it would be clearly French. No, it's, it's really everything. It's Spanish. Again, because I speak French, it's French, it's English. It's to convey this message to as many people as possible. Um, so it's it's all the languages, so I'm cheating. And who would the audience be? I'm cheating again because I'm supposed to have an audience, but I would say everyone. And the reason is because we're all alive. We're all going through the same, it's a different, of course, but the same experience of being human on earth. And so the message really is, my hope is for, for everyone. Thank you very much, Chloe. And Maya. Yeah, so I want to pretty much echo what everyone else is saying. Um, you can't just choose one, right? Um, but if I could convey a message in a language, it would be actually the space between languages. Um, because to me, there's nothing more fun or more impactful than when people are using multiple languages at once. Um, not just one language separately at different times, right? Um, because each language conveys different emotions, subtleties, uh, aspirations. And so combined, a person is more complete um, and a, a more interesting message emerges. So I guess my message would be that I see you and I hear you. And my audience would be um, anyone who's ever felt ashamed for using their languages. Um, so, yeah. Oh, thank you. We'll, we'll remember that when trying to come up with those, those French phrases that we once knew and are now ashamed that we can't quite remember. <laughs> uh, and uh, Caitlin. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, as a novelist, I was thinking I'm really bad at boiling things down to one particular sentence or message. But, um, you know, I, I actually, this is like not to be a downer, but I'm thinking about where we are now. And, and I was thinking a lot about language and obviously these cross-cultural exchanges and how the pandemic has really pushed, I mean, even politically, and you think about where we are and how we are talking about things, um, kind of pushed countries apart so much like being in lockdown from each other and it's made me think a lot about 
flows and freedoms that we have as Americans that, and even just, a, you know, obviously from a racial perspective and class and all of these things that weigh into who we are and the way we navigate the world. And so I've been thinking a lot about how much we've lost in this last year, obviously, and how yet still hopeful I am for what is to come and what that means, like what sort of lessons we take from um, how separated we've had to be and when we reconnect like what's coming out of that and um also from a generational thing just being a mom I can't help but look at my daughter and think about what's to come for her and for all of the children like Chloe the work that you're doing um for all of us and what that means generationally um and I'm hopeful that that's why in these kinds of experiences that we have can continue to um not separate you know and not lock down and have borders and you know what that what that means um so yeah that's sort of that's what I was thinking right now a, a great note to end on uh Caitlin and um my, my message to all of you is is a heartfelt thank you gracias merci uh in in any language of your choosing um and I really it has been a wonderful uh conversation with you all. I, I wish we could spend many more hours uh, talking. And I really hope someday to meet you all in person, not as a little square. But thank you all very, very much for participating. Thank you to our audience for listening uh, and viewing. Um, we're seeing lots of uh, very nice messages of thanks in the chat. Uh, and I wish you all a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, um, whatever, whatever time it is for you. So thanks again.